Thank you for now. All right, should be recording. So what we're talking about is rainscaping. That's a step beyond xeriscaping. So xeriscaping has been held up as this great way of landscaping so that we don't need a lawn and therefore we don't need to irrigate a lawn. And for cities like San Antonio, where 70% of a home's water use is on the landscape, it makes a lot of sense to make a transition away from a thirsty lawn. However, a xeriscape only goes so far. Xeriscaping Zero, just conserves water. We don't need to spray any more out. But oftentimes, we kind of create mini deserts when we do that because we, landscapers will put down a black plastic layer and then they'll put rocks on top of that. And the black plastic layer, while it keeps the weeds out, it also keeps the rainwater from entering the ground. And one of the biggest environmental problems that Central Texas faces is flash flooding and drought. When our land dries up because the water can't get into the soil, well, that's going to lead to drought. When the water can't get into the soil when it's raining, that's going to lead to flash flooding. So that's the general gist of this concept. And I'll talk you through the details now. So, oops. let's talk about what a rain garden is and why it's important. So, whenever it rains, we have a huge amount of water coming off of our roofs and our landscapes and contributing to flash flooding. And to understand that, we can, you know, uh, look at this watershed analysis. And what this shows is a suburban landscape where there's a uh, two watersheds. Each of those big brown splotches represent two micro watersheds. So all of the water that falls on the splotch on the left goes through that blue line at the center of it. And all the one that falls on the purplish one next to it goes to that blue line at the center of it. So when we're assessing where we can put these rain catching um, structures, we look at this information and we say, oh, well, you know, we can catch it this way. So what a rain garden is, is in simple terms, a basin dug into the ground to catch the water and slowly release it. And why we want to slowly release it is because that allows us to filter off runoff pollution. The pollution will stay in that basin and not continue to the river. It lets the land soak up water so that it's more drought hardy. This is lower maintenance compared to a lawn. As most of us know, native plant gardens are less maintenance than mowing every week. Uh, the beautiful blooms enhance the curb appeal of the house. We've got habitat for wildlife. And we're, by catching that water, reducing the potential for flooding. Every 100 gallons that doesn't make it immediately to the river is another 100 gallons that's out of the flash flooding. And 100 gallons in the flash flood equation is pretty small, but every drop adds up, right? So here's a image showing that ev basically every home anywhere is in a watershed. It doesn't matter if you're at the top of the hill or the bottom of a hill, you're part of a watershed and the water that lands on your landscape will end up somewhere downstream from you. So for instance, this home, the water is gonna flow down the street, it's gonna enter a storm drain. This is an, an urban area in Austin. And it's going to be carried by that storm drain into that creek. Well, it used to be a creek. Now it's concrete channel. And they had to line that con channel of that creek with concrete because all of the runoff water from all of the impervious cover of those houses was hitting that creek so hard and fast that it was ripping the banks open. So this home may contribute just a little bit. But when we catch the water that's flowing here and here with earthworks perpendicular to that flow, then we're able to at least take a little bit of water out of that equation that's going into that storm drain. And when we do that, it makes the earth smile. Here's what a large scale structure like that looks like when it's full of water. That's all water that would have been running off downhill headed for the nearest creek to create flash flooding and it would be lost to these trees. In this case, now it's nurturing fruit trees and those oak trees. And it's not contributing to flash flooding down at the creek. So here's what a rainscape looks like as we're starting to build it, when we're doing what we call a test fill to make sure that, yes, the water holds in it the way we want it to. And there's what it looks like when it's got the stones in 
and is just starting to grow in. So to understand this a little more, I want to follow the journey of a raindrop through the landscape. We've got this serious issue with development and urban cover. So when rain falls on a rooftop, it has to go somewhere, right? It can't sink into the soil there. So it follows down the roof, goes into a gutter, goes across the lawn, and if you don't have anything in its way, it's going to go down out the driveway and toward the storm drain. But when you, we place these rain gardens in play in the landscape, we can catch the water in them and hold it, and that sinks that water deep into the ground. Our native plants love it to grow. Our native trees love that extra water. And we're doing a great thing in that we're preventing that flash flood water from hitting our creek. So water cascades down into the rain garden, we get that deep infiltration where the water sinks into the ground. And when we're doing this, we're mimicking the natural environment, right? So when a natural ground cover system is rained on, about 25% of that water sinks deep into the ground. About 25% of it does what's called shallow infiltration. About 10% will run off and then the, the other 40% just kind of evaporates. Well, in the place where rain is so precious to us, we want to get as much infiltration of that water as we can, right? But the way we've constructed our cities is counter to that. We lose water over our cities because as we develop, we compact that soil and make it so that we don't get as much infiltration, either shallowly or deeply. Um, and you can see from these diagrams how drastic that loss is. So in downtown Austin or downtown San Antonio or downtown New Braunfels or downtown San Marcos, all of those areas are often pretty much 100% impervious cover, which means that all of that water is running off and heading for storm drains, which is not a great situation for a watershed. So, because for every thousand square feet of rooftop or roadway, that means that 600 gallons of water is going to run off in just one inch of rain. So, what does 600 gallons of water look like? Well, that's a woman about my size in a fish tank that's 600 gallons. 600 gallons is a pretty large amount of water. And when we start to think about, oh, we want to build a thousand homes here, and each of those homes is going to have 2,000 square feet of roof, plus another thousand square feet of driveway, how quickly are we at millions and millions of gallons of water that are being just discharged to our creeks and rivers? One home is a drop in the bucket, but it all adds up. And uh, Peggy, I see you've got your hand raised. Oh, we're not seeing your slides. Oh, uh, they're not changing for you? Um, no. It's you because hey, yeah, I am. Oh, well, then it's me. Sorry, babe. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. Just uh, maybe try refreshing it or something. I'm, I'm not sure how to, how to provide tech support on that. Um, but here we have some slides by um, Raymond Slade. He's a uh, hydrologist, and he gave me permission to use these to explain this. So when we have a natural hydrograph, it's like this lower red line where it's nice, smooth curve. And, you know, it rains, the curve peaks, and then it goes back down. When we have these built up urban situations, that peak comes really hard and really fast. It becomes a really big surge of water, and then it dies back down really quickly. And it dies down to less than what the natural basin would have had because the water that slowly would be trickling to the ground or to the, uh, creek isn't able to do that anymore because it hasn't gotten into the soil in the first place. So we've seen a lot of horrific flooding stories, I'm sure, because we all live in central Texas. We know what this looks like. Huge amounts of bank erosion, taking down people's backyards, making it so that someone's head, uh, someone's shed is just about to fall into the creek there. And all of this is often the result of development further upstream and not being able to regulate the amount of water that's coming off of those suburbs. Especially when we get really huge rain events, often the suburb will have something designed to slow the water down and catch a certain amount, but if it becomes above a 
storm that they've designed for, it can become too much and overwhelm the systems that are in place. And then what this is, is following an old paradigm where we move the water away from homes as quickly as we can. The engineers of the subdivision said, hey, there's this much water coming off of these roofs. We need to get it away from these homes and we'll just put it over there for our downstream neighbors to deal with. So for instance, in San Marcos, we have the storm drains and luckily they're labeled what goes here flows here and that is intended to discourage people from letting trash get in. But trash is just the most visible symptom of the stormwater pollution that we face. There's also hydrocarbons, heavy metals, and even the thermal pollution, just the heat of the pavement can shock the river and kill off fish. And in this instance, we're in the beautiful San Marcos River, the water cascades down from that downspout and into this pristine, clear, cool, cool water. There it is going out and out into the beautiful river. So we've got to think about what goes in those drains. And I want to kind of tell the story of two rivers. Um, San Marcos River and the San Antonio River used to look just alike. Um, the Kamal River is the same way. It's beautiful. It's spring fed. Well, the San Marcos River remains gorgeous, cool, clean, and clear. Great swimming, great for recreating. Now we have the San Antonio River and how many people here would like to swim in the San Antonio River? Uh, I'm guessing it's not too many. Um, it's, you know, just barely above swimming, you know, allowability, but it's nasty looking water. But this river was spring fed the same way as the San Marcos River and the Comal River is still spring fed in that way in some places, but the effects of development, which have been careless and not really taking much stock of, well, where is our water going? How is this water being discharged to our river? All of that has added up to making the San Antonio River um, kind of a mess. It doesn't look like one of our clean, clear, you know, hill country rivers. It looks like a muddy bayou in Houston. And in fact, in some places, the river itself is channelized with concrete to um, prevent it from flooding in the same, you know, and creating erosion when the river goes up. Here we have a willow tree doing um, some really good work harvesting trash out of the San Antonio River, but you can see that that's the most visible symptom of pollution here, and that's a lot of trash. And all of that runoff and pollution in the San Antonio River comes from the whole watershed, right? It comes from construction sites, it comes from farms, it comes from the city, it comes from ranching and agriculture, it comes from the parking lot outside your local Walmart. Well, and it also comes from our own yards. We might not be able to do anything about the farm or the city or an industrial sites, but we can do something about our yard. That's within our control. We can make sure that our yard isn't contributing in a negative way to the health of our river. So what does that look like, you know? Well, we can make these rain garden basins. It's as simple as digging a hole and catching the water from your rooftop so that you're not discharging a whole bunch of water when it rains each time. We can all be part of the solution on this. And this is one day's worth of cans on the San Marcos River that were collected by the eyes of the San Marcos. This is a huge amount of trash, but remember that trash is just the most visible part and what we can do to take really good care of our rivers is slow that water down, spread it out, and sink it into our soil so that it reaches the river slowly and isn't carrying a bunch of trash there. There's one more piece of critical information that I'd like to share with you. It's a little high level, but it also shows that we have a tremendous capacity to store water in our soil if we make it spongy. So, for every 1% increase in soil organic carbon, that's the amount of carbon in the soil, the soil gains on average 20,000 gallons of storage capacity per acre. So what that means is, okay, if you have, you know, say a one acre property and you're able to increase its organic matter from 1% to 
to 5%, which would be a pretty modest increase over five years if you do some really smart regenerative management and stop spraying er any herbicides or pesticides and jumpstart your soil microbial life with uh, compost teas and mulching and native plants, we can get that from less than 1%, which is pretty typical of suburban yards up to 5%. That means that that one acre has gained four, gained four percentage points or 80,000 gallons of water storage capacity. And that's huge in terms of preventing flash flooding in our rivers. And it comes from the way we take care of the land and increasing that soil organic carbon. That's what 20,000 gallons looks like, by the way. And you can gain that per acre per percentage point and keep going up. Our historic area used to have between eight and 12% soil organic carbon, depending on where you are. So we could really increase from that, you know, less than 0.1 or less than 1% that most yards are at right now. So it's all about sinking that water into the soil so that it can make its way to our rivers it, slowly over time. And it's a small scale and collective solution to stormwater pollution. It takes all of the, you know, all of the land that's in the watershed from the hilltops to the river's edge is all contributing. And it can be contributing in a positive way by, you know, runoff of fertilizer and pesticides or leaking tanks from the gas station, all of that can be negative. Or we can find ways to make our yards contribute in a positive way using rainscaping. So the past attitude towards stormwater has been that this is a waste product. And how silly is it to treat water like waste in Texas when we have so many droughts? But the idea has been, oh, we've got this problem with too much water here. We've got to create a pipe and we've got to push that water away so that it goes downstream. And just now, people are starting to catch hold of, well, maybe this isn't the best idea because we keep getting really bad flood, flash flooding in those downstream communities, and we have really bad droughts. Maybe a better solution is to use this water. So how do we do that? Well, what we do is we slow that water down spread that water out and sink that water in. And when I'm doing this presentation in person, I like to have everyone repeat that with me. So if you wanna sit in your, you know, in your home and say that with me real quick, it would be good because this is the core message here. If you get nothing else from me tonight, get that what we should do with our stormwater is slow it down, spread it out and sink it in. That's slow it down, spread it out, sink it in. When we do that with our water, all of our plants are healthier and we've done a lot to help our watershed too. So what does that look like? If you're really doing it right, you're going to have tanks to catch that water. You're going to have infiltration beds with thick soil and places where you can sink that water down into the ground so that none of the water from your land gets to the storm drain unless it's a huge, huge storm event that your yard has caught everything that it can. You caught three inches of rain, and then, oh, that fourth inch, it ran off into the street. Hey, you did great. On the other hand, most of the time, what we have is there's no space for infiltration in our yards, and people are just letting, you know, whatever go down the storm drains. People letting trash go down the storm drains, oil and gas dripping from cars going down there. There's a, you know, leaves can block those storm drains as well. So what we want to focus on is the, the doing it right here on the left. How much water can we store in our landscapes should be the name of the game. And this is a school of thought called low impact development or green stormwater infrastructure. This is how it gets referred to in uh, professional and municipal circles. They talk about how we can manage stormwater runoff using green infrastructure or low impact development so that we create less runoff and less intense flooding uh, using these series of soft engineering techniques that harnesses the power of native grasses to slow spread and sink the water into the ground. So when we catch that groundwater, we get it to sink in. When it's infiltrated into the soil, there's this underground water flow that happens that slowly discharges that water to the, that it, to the streams. Um, in the hill country, we have quite a few quote unquote disappearing creeks where for a little while you won't be able to see the water of the creek, but it's under there 
and then it gets to a certain elevation drop and you can see that water again. So this is a more of a technical diagram. It talks about bioswales, bioretention cells, rain gardens. These are all green infrastructure techniques that fall into the category of rainscaping. <clears throat> so when we're, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> When we're looking at our hydrology, we want to think about it, you know, the same way we think about having a carbon footprint. There's things we can do that generate a larger footprint and things we can do that generate a smaller footprint. The larger the roof, the larger the roadway, the larger the pa paved area, um, the more area that's been driven over repeatedly and compacted, all of that is area that's going to cause runoff. But what we can do is we can plan, okay, well, we need to have a roof, okay? So where are we gonna, what are we gonna do with that roof's water? Let's make a plan for it. Or we need to have this driveway here. Everybody's gotta have a driveway. What are we gonna do with the water that runs off from that driveway? We have a plan for it and we can make it so that the driveway runoff becomes a positive thing that water is a new tree that we put in. Or we have the water from our roof going into a rain tank and then we use that to water the garden. And the plants really love that. So all this is is figuring out ways that we can recharge our aquifer by infiltrating the water slowly over time rather than letting it run off. Because our storm events, the rain comes really hard and it comes fast and that just doesn't give it enough time to sink into the soil in the way it needs to. So we have to help it out and make structures that are gonna help it sink into the soil. Again, we're gonna slow it, spread it, and sink it. And that's gonna keep the water cool, clear, and copious for future generations. Here's a cross section of what a swale looks like. You can see how you dig out a hole and then pile the soil on the downhill side. And that's a it's soil that's piled up is a great place to plant trees. It's a little easier digging. And the trees love that access to the easy water next to them. Um, a swale is just another term for a rain garden basin. Here's what that looks like on a farm scale. So they built these terraces to capture that water. And she's got, you know, probably 10 to 20,000 gallons of water there that she got for free falling out of the sky. This is at Boxcar Farm and Gardens. They raise pasture raised pork and uh, it's really excellent, excellent farming that they do. It's regenerative. Uh, so they're helping the water and helping the soil with their, uh, their pork production. Uh, what we can do in our basins, like what they showed there, is we can in, in plant that with grasses that help the water to infiltrate. So what happens is the deep roots of the native grasses, which we are so blessed with here, those will punch holes even in thick, heavy clay and create what are called root channels. And that guides the water down because water can only follow the path of least resistance. So when those roots open up holes, they go down through the path of least resistance and the water can sink into the soil rather than being trapped on the surface and creating a little you know, ponded area. Um, this vegetation also provides habitat for wildlife tremendous amounts of carbon source sequestration. The only thing is we need to be careful about selecting plants that can handle inundation. You know, you wouldn't want to put a prickly pear cactus in the bottom of a basin because it would drown. So there's a little bit of skill here involved in knowing, hey, which plants can we put in the water for part of the time, but most of the time they're going to be dry because these aren't ponds. It's not like we're using true wetland plants. What we're using is plants that can stand drying out repeatedly, um, but also being flooded. And there is a, a diagram of those great native plant roots. You can see over here on the left hand side, uh, just, uh, just next to the, the scale bar, there's a teeny tiny grass. That's most of the turf grasses that are uh, that are used. They have a six inches to a foot of root depth. Huh. Excuse me. And that six inches to a foot of root depth is obviously very, very different than the, you know, 15 feet of root depth provided by a compass plant. If you're a drop of water trying to follow the path of least resistance down into the soil, that turf grass isn't going to get that water very deep. Whereas a, you know, compass plant 
or a Indian grass or a big blue stem or a switchgrass, those are plants that are going to help that water really sink deep into the soil and help recharge the aquifer. So we can do it right using native plants. Here's an example of a, you know, pretty boring suburban yard. There's not a whole lot going on here, kind of some mixed patch turf. And this is what we were able to transform it into in less than six months. And that fills up the cup of life. We're catching water, we're using it in that landscape. So next I wanna go over with you um, what we do to water, to, to plan for these, how we make a watershed analysis. And the way we do that is by looking at the LIDAR mapping technology and the set of maps there shows us, uh, we can analyze that to show where the water flows across the landscape. A lot of this uses topographic maps that, have con that show the contour and this diagram next to it shows how one foot decrease in elevation equates to one of those contour lines on a hill. Uh, we also look at soil type and we look at the ecoregion. So in this case, we have a very large cornfield and all of that cornfield runoff goes into that neighborhood, runs past my client's house, which is outlined in that black box, and then continues into that basin there. And you can see that green basin is probably where the engineers decided, hey, all of the water from this neighborhood, we're going to capture it right here, rather than catching it at each individual root. So here's just another example of how contour lines work. What we want to do is catch that water and sink it into the ground. So this is at the Garcia Street, oh, excuse me, the Garcia Street Urban Farm in San Antonio. We analyzed that landscape for them. They wanted to make sure that the uh, water wasn't going to create any problems for them or the school that was downhill of them. And what we found from this was that what they were doing on their land would have very little impact on the school, that the school was being impacted by uh, pretty much all of uh, the lower two thirds of this, this watershed map. This breaks it down a little further and shows how um, the individual sub-basins feed into those networks. From there, we generate a design like this one that plans to capture that rainwater runoff and use it and spread it out across the contour so that the plants can have access to it and the fruit trees can have access to it. There's their full plan showing all of the fruit trees. And here's the other side of it showing community garden plots and it fully growing with vegetables and crop plants. Um, this project is currently in progress. They're doing a lot of work out there. It's pretty impressive. It's a partnership between the San Antonio Housing Authority and uh, the Alamo Colleges and it's uh, designed to address the food desert on the east side of San Antonio. Um, also, I wanted to show you an example from a riverfront residence on the Blanco. So we performed a watershed analysis here and we're able to see how the water moved across their narrow lot and down to the river. And from this, we were able to determine where the best places to catch it were. We have that exact topography in our computer model. And then we break this down and see, okay, we're receiving water down this red section. We're receiving water down this pink section, this green section. Where can we catch this? And this is the solution we came up with to catch that water. You can see those basins broken out and the um, sub watersheds broken out in different colors with basins to capture the water from each of those. Uh, that's a lot of information. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Um, Shannon, you had a question from Susan Bogle. It looks like um, Jennifer Bain um, provided somewhat of an answer, but she was asking, what do you do um, if it doesn't rain for an extended period? Do you 
how do you provide any kind of supplemental water or do you? So you can have an irrigation system, like a low volume drip irrigation system is usually what we set up for these, or you can just hand water it. Um, it definitely is the type of thing where all like with all native gardens, it does take a few years to get established. Once it's established, it doesn't really need the supplemental watering. Um, but for in the in-between times, while it's just getting started, it is great to be able to uh, either hand water it when it needs it or just if you want to set it up and forget it, we also, you know, provide irrigation systems that can just be set up and forgotten. Does that answer your question? Excuse me. Uh, I was just wondering, because it's so rocky around here, can, can, can you accomplish the same thing that you're talking about by using rocks on the surface? So we can line up rocks on contour to kind of slow the water a little bit. Um, the thing about creating a berm or creating a line of rocks on top is that it doesn't add much capacity, right? It's like, a, a, it's asking a plate to do the job of a bowl. You know what I mean? So um, a plate can only hold so much water, but with the shape of a bowl, it can hold a lot more water. Um, we have definitely dug in rocky areas and often when we dig those, um, when we dig those gardens, we will stop at four inches or three inches, wherever we hit limestone bedrock and we'd have to get out a jackhammer, that's when we stop, uh, generally. Unless the client wants us to get out a jackhammer, we, we can do that too. But um, generally people are like, oh, no, you found bedrock, that's good. And that's a good stopping point. We've caught some of the water, we've made a nice wide uh, basin, but you know, we don't necessarily need to break our backs going any deeper than that. Um, did that cover it? Yeah. Um, it seems like a line of rocks would at least help the water to sink down, though, into, this, into your soil. It, instead it of can. Yeah, it definitely can. Um, and it depends how well that works depends on how tight the holes are between the rocks. The more surface area and the smaller the rocks are at the bottom of that, the more water it'll hold. Um, but it can certainly be used that way. I've also used um, br branches cut from cedar trees laid on contour to slow the water that way. Um, but it, you know, we do want to make sure that these things are on contour uh, rather than uh, off to the side. Right, right. Oh. It sounds to me like you're also saying that if you're in this situation where you have a, a lot of, where you have rock close, somewhat close to the surface, maybe you can do a, a larger area that's shallow. Is that what you were kind of saying before? Yes, that, yes. We can definitely achieve the same uh, capacity of water by spreading it out over a larger space. So rather than having, you know, a six inch deep by 10 foot long, we could do four inches deep by 15 feet long kind of thing. All right. Reasonable. I'll keep moving right along. Um, let's see. There we go. So next I want to show you all some specific examples of uh, rain gardens. So we have our basic level. Um, this is like a flood control rain garden. The whole purpose here is just to keep the water from pooling and uh, around their foundation uh, and threatening to flood their back porch. Um, and also like it was reaching within about a half inch of flooding their neighbor's air conditioning unit, which was it just a bad situation for everyone. So on their budget, you know, a $2,500 budget, we were able to uh, construct this rain garden in their backyard uh, and make it so that it stops the flooding and has a really nice aesthetic um, and makes a really cool backyard for them. So we fixed those flooding problems. We didn't do, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> we didn't do any prior design work on this. We just came out, measured the contour and started digging. This basin catches water from off of their property that was coming at them. This was a really shaded backyard, so we had to pick all shade tolerant native plants. Um, this client was concerned about keeping it cheap, so we just used uh, mulch, not stone, which is definitely more functional and cheaper. 
There were no gutters or downspouts necessary in this project, so that was a great way to keep it cheap. Um, we prevented that ponding around the foundation, and the um, there was space that we created where we wanted the water to flood so that it stopped flooding around that air conditioning unit. There's the Texas Betony. It's a really nice shade tolerant plant. There are the guys getting started digging. And there are the plants all laid out. We've got uh, Mexican buckeye and river fern and flame acanthus and eastern gamma grass all in there. So the, we used 56 different native plants um, from 28 different species. Um, the client was absolutely thrilled that their flooding problem solved. In fact, they took a video during the first big storm event showing, hey, look, it, this is where we used to have flooding against our patio. Now the water is trapped over there and our, our house is safe and our neighbor's house doesn't have the air conditioner unit about to flood. Um, he calls it their cool little nature oasis in their backyard and uh, you know everything worked out well and we stayed within that budget. There's me with one of my favorite grasses, the Eastern Gamma grass. Those are all the native plants together. We tried to save a little oak tree there. Lots of native plants. We plant exclusively native plants unless a client requests something in particular, um, but I'm not gonna plant invasive even if they ask for it. I've been asked to plant bamboo before and said absolutely not. Um, then we have a, a higher level of rain garden. This is an artistic rain garden in Wimberley. This is a, one of our higher end gardens. We go through a whole process of uh, consultation and design. It's pretty lifeless turf grass. And then boom, it's transformed to this. This was planted in April and this picture was taken in July. Um, so it really grew in rapidly and very nicely. Uh, we used 45 plus native species. I actually lost count. Um, so we envision the, the <coughs> excuse me, uh, this is for a different yard, but we start out the process with, by envisioning it. We actually no longer uh, offer sketch designs. We just offer full designs for, through the computer. Um, we discuss at that time, you know, what wildlife preferences you want to see hummingbirds or butterflies more. We always have this caveat with rain gardens too, that if you wouldn't put it in your mouth and drink it, you shouldn't put it in a rain garden because this water goes directly to our groundwater supply. So it is very, very important that, you know, we're not putting uh, Roundup or, you know, pesticides that are persistent down in that rain garden. On this one in uh, out near Canyon Lake, we used 42 different native plant species and it turned out really nicely as well. We like to plant the plants small, but they grow in really quickly. That helps our clients save on their budget, though we can also do what we call instant gratification plants, which are a lot larger and look full instantaneously. Here we are back in Wimberley, roughing out the digging for that site, getting it prepared, um, building out the walls, digging out those basins. Then we like to test fill them and make sure everything flows accordingly. So that basin fills up and then it moves down to the lower basin below it, right like that, through that pipe under the sidewalk. And then it move, on the other side, it moves down this structure through that dry creek and out into the basin. We used a lot of plants in this. Um, we really like to bring home the biodiversity. That's one of our main missions is to provide food and shelter uh, for oh. wildlife as much through the year as we can. Um, and we do that by offering all sorts of native plants that are gonna bloom at different times of years. There's a, all the plants in front of the house. And this is our layout. Lots of little plants and they grow it really, really fast. Like you saw in that picture within three months, excuse me, three months or so, this was a full garden. 
And this is that eastern gamma grass. Again, you can see those really intense roots that help bust up the soil and carry the water down deep into the ground. There's our fall obedient plant. That's one of the best plants for in the basins of the rain garden where it gets inundated with water. And here are some that we like to use on the berms. The blackfoot daisy, callilophus, and verbena would all drown in a basin, but they are perfectly happy on top of the berms. There's another rain garden basin, all planted. Everything is fully planted and ready to go. That's my dog, Valley. She helped dig the hole for that tree. She's a good helper. And you can see that the soil looks a little rough here, but we're about to cover it up with um, some mushroom compost and uh, irrigation line. So this one was fully irrigated so that the homeowners didn't have to worry about plants dying when it got too hot or too dry and we hadn't had rain for months. So they had that insurance policy. There's the verbena looking nice. And then with that top dressing layer of mulch, it starts to look a lot better, a lot like a garden. It's amazing what that first layer of mulch does in terms of making the, the visual impact of it look so much prettier. And then we lined it with stones just to make it pop. Generally, I like to talk to my clients about how hot stones can get, so we try and limit the use of stones, um, because, especially if we're on the west side of a building, because those stones can get quite hot and increase the electricity bill, as well as, you know, fry the plants. I have a, you know, rule of thumb, like if we don't want to hold our hand on this for more than five seconds in August, well, how does our plant feel sitting in that all day, right? So there it is fully planted and this is it growing in. It's its first rainstorm. It's filled up with all of the, the storm water runoff that would have just gone down the street and the plants are thriving. They're very happy about that. The mealy blue sage is looking good. And so we have water coming through that way to get to that lower basin, more water coming that way. And there's a little more work to do to put another basin over here and catch that water too, but that's for later. So here it is growing in a little bit more. This is, I think about June or July. Yeah, this is probably about June. Um, so two months after installing it, the plants are really growing in nicely. We got lots of blooms from the pink evening primrose and the cowpen daisy, cedar sage, mealy blue sage is a favorite. And she got delighted by all of the hummingbirds fighting over the plants in her yard. It was really great. Um, she got inspired by the garden. We did have to add this uh, Deer sprayer, because the deer kept wanting to visit, even though we use deer resistant plants. Some of them are, you know, a little more moderately deer resistant and require a little more uh, intense protection. So we tried that and that worked pretty well for a while until it got hot enough that the deer didn't care. Um, it, they'll get used to it. There's a lot of little details of beauty to look for in these gardens, like the flowers of switchgrass and little flowers of frog fruit. Uh, we got lots of red colors for plants for uh, Turk's cap and uh, um, standing cypress for the hummingbirds. And this one was a surprise. This uh, scarlet pea just popped up as a volunteer plant and started growing among the verbena. And what a great color combo that is. I was really glad that we left that quote unquote weed and let it grow in to make sure that we knew what it was before we pulled it and we got a surprise by waiting. So there's the purple cone flower doing really nicely. Silver pony foot I love to use because it makes that cascading look like falling water. Here's the Eastern gamma grass, like a Jurassic Park grass is what we call it. And now I wanna talk about <clears throat> a really exciting program that's going on in Austin where they have looked at the flooding along Waller Creek and shown that it's a severe problem um, and it's affecting the downtown district and it's affecting neighbors all the way upstream. 
So one of the things that they want to do, because the city of Austin is put in this position where they cannot keep buying large tracts of land to make huge detention ponds anymore. It simply has gotten too expensive and there's not enough big tracts left together. So what they're looking at is doing dispersed flood control. So saying, hey, what if we had each homeowner catching their own stormwater runoff? What if we could get everyone to catch a 1.3 inch storm in their own yard? What if we could get just seven, if they can get 75% of homeowners in this neighborhood, which is a lot, but if they can get it to 75%, they'll go back to that natural hydrograph, like that yellow graph that I showed you with the spiked blue line and the slow gradual red line. That slow gradual natural curve is what we're trying to achieve here. So this was one of the very first pilot projects of this program. And we were really honored to participate in that with, through the uh, help of uh, Urban Patchwork, the nonprofit working with the city of Austin. Uh, Waller Creek is just behind that fence where those windows are. So you can see we laid out the plants. We've got this large basin to catch the stormwater runoff and keep it from flooding into the creek. That's what it looked like before. And here's the front yard. We've got basins on both sides there. So we worked with some student volunteers on this project to educate them about stormwater runoff. There's a lot involved with uh, the rebate side of this that Urban Patchwork managed for us. And we used an altimeter, which is a specialized piece of equipment to make sure that we got our conveyance structures to work just right. So this is it grown in a little bit with, uh, after it was dug, the students are helping to, um, you know, dig this basin out and pile up around the other side to create a berm, see it as a work in progress. <clears throat> that was a great day. The students had a lot of fun getting to, you know, dig. We got to test that rain garden and see, yep, it does indeed hold water just like it's planned to. And we're designing to catch 100% of the runoff for a 1.3 inch storm. And uh, we had to remove this China, invasive china berry from the backyard. Uh, boom, there it's gone. A note on process, one of the things that we probably should have done is plan this out so that that china berry tree was removed before we dug the basin because we ended up having to spend a significant amount of time picking out every single china berry tree, uh, berry seed out of this rain garden um, so that it wouldn't create a bunch of uh, seedlings. So we filled about a five gallon bucket with those. Oops. <clears throat> so anyway, we also brought out a bunch of plants. This is in December. So some of things look a little bit rough or a little bit dormant. That's just how it is sometimes. Um, what went well is we had these smooth, consistent slope uh, conveyance swales that worked really nicely. You can see one there carrying the water from all over the side yard into the basin in the back. Um, the design by Urban Patchwork and they did the volume calculations and helped ease the workload there. Um, the volunteer students brought a lot of energy and enthusiasm. There's that design showing where the water moves from. Uh, big trees make people very happy. We've got that fall aster blooming really nicely. And we used flags to plant, mark the plants during mulching so that they wouldn't get trampled on. And the students say, it's you know your turn, it's our turn. They found this big worm. And I had made the mistake of telling them that uh, I like to put bugs on my face. And well, a worm isn't exactly a bug, but they brought me that and told me it was my turn. So I ended up with a, a worm on my face. <laughs> but it's all about, you know, doing that humble work, doing the digging, and that's what it takes to transform our landscapes, to make them resilient, make them hold water and catch water and sink that into the ground and be a source of giving back, a source of water for Waller Creek in the future. Rather than being part of the problem, this home, is now part of the solution. And that's a great place to be and a great way to live. Uh, my contact information is here and I'll just take a few seconds to go over. Uh, here's the little sales pitch side of it. <clears throat> we do have 
these packages created now to make it very easy to just order one of these rain gardens and have it added to your home. We have the prairie dog package, which is the small one. And these are kind of ballpark figures. Um, we can customize from here. Usually we uh, do quite a bit of customization and add plants or remove plants or add more mulch, just depending. But there's the prairie dog package. This is like the basic entry level rain garden that just gets the job done. And you can always add stone to that as well. Then we have the mid-grade javelina package, which is a little bit more involved, um, comes with um, some design work and a plant layout. And then the bison package is for a larger, fancy, full-scale project. Um, usually this is, you know, completely surrounding a home. And, uh, you know, this is pretty high-end and oftentimes this is, you know, a uh, $20,000 plus kind of job. All right, does anyone have uh, questions? Did I put y'all to sleep? <laughs> I think we're all still here. That was awesome, Shannon. And thank you so I much. I did ask a question. Um, if there's one plant you could recommend for growing from seed that would, I, I was probably grass, but uh, for for shallow rocky soil. Uh, are we talking sun or shade? Uh, sun. Sun and shallow rocky soil. Um, I would say little blue stem as a grass or silver blue stem as a grass and then probably some uh, blanket flower as the um, as the as a four but uh, also depending on you know deer you may might change that to something else. Yeah, that's probably got lots of deer. Okay, thanks. Yeah, mealy blue sage is a good one for if there's lots of deer. Okay. Or prairie verbena. Yeah, the prairie verbena does well. Yeah. Hmm. Um, you have a question from Pam. She says she has a neighbor, a new neighbor that wants to start putting in plants this fall. Oh, sorry. Um, and oh, does does Peggy have your information that uh, we could get in touch with you if this person was interested? Sure. Let me go back real quick. Um, my contact information is right here. Uh, are you able to see that? Yes. And um, let me go reaching. I'm just writing it down. All right. Where are you based, Shannon? We're based in San Marcos, but we serve the entire Edwards Aquifer region. Um, the idea is San Marcos kind of sits right in the center. So we serve Austin, we serve San Antonio. We've gone up to Pflugerville, we've gone out to Medina. Um, you know, we'll go where, where there's work like this to be done because it is a specialized type of landscaping. Do you know a person named David Mahler? Yes, I do. He's a mentor of mine. He's, he's oh, okay. Uh, so is he still involved in doing this type of thing or? Yes, his company Environmental Survey Consulting is a, a big player up in Austin. Okay. Yeah, they're doing doing wonderful work up there. They've got a, a big team. I can remember many years ago he had kind of, um, I think he had kind of invented like a little uh, seed harvester little deal that he kind of uh, attached to a weed eater, I think, or something like that a long time ago. Oh, how interesting. That's a neat <laughs> story. I hadn't heard that one yet. But yeah, it's important to be able to harvest those seeds. Absolutely. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, we still have Shannon with us. Well, again, we certainly appreciate you doing this, especially kind of 
last minute a little bit and um, always a wonderful presentation and lots of great, great information. So again, we truly appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, I'll take the host back. That way I can. Certainly. Um, thank you, Shannon. It was very good. Yeah, thank you all for the opportunity. Yeah, it was great. great. It's it's just just very interesting. Interesting. Something very needed. You can come back anytime. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Always, always interesting. Yeah, spread the word, y'all. We need a rainwater revival. <laughs> All right, well, um, unless anybody had any more questions or comments or anything tonight, I think, um, I think that's about it for us today. Um, and kind of watch for announcements coming up about exactly how we'll do the seed exchange. Um, I'm hoping that we can accommodate people in different ways and how we might be able to accomplish some kind of um, holiday party. So watch for all of that. And um, I'm glad we had such a good tur turnout tonight. So unless anybody has anything else, I guess we'll go ahead and and call it a Bye, night. everybody. Bye. Y'all have a good much. one. Thanks, Thanks again, Shannon. Bye, My pleasure. Thank y'all.